cycling, swimming, canoeing, no, not a new form of triathlon, but the sporting career of our guest in this edition of the podcast. All three sports have been extremely successful in recent Olympic and Paralympic Games, and with Paris now less than two years away, how to maintain that. I'm Michael. And I'm John, and it's a matter of fact all three sports have had their challenges too. So how do we bring through the next generation? This is Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy, a podcast series focusing on the men and women behind the scenes of sport in the UK. I'm Chris Ferber. I'm the Performance Director for Power Canoe and Canoe Sprint at British Canoeing. We mentioned the sports. Michael mentioned the sports that you've worked with. Why canoeing? The opportunity to come here and, and lead this team was just too good for me to turn down. And, and, uh, and when the opportunity came up, I, I really considered whether I had a skill set to be able to come into this sport and, 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 and deliver, deliver some success. I, I'd actually had an association with, with canoeing in the past. So I came to Nottingham Trent University when I did my undergraduate degree in sports science and administration, 96 to 99. And I lived for three years with a with a um, a paddler who was who was part of the setup who who did sprint kayaking. So so I'd I'd been around not the national centre. I'd, I'd seen how the sport worked. Certainly, when I was coaching sprint cycling and we saw uh, the two hundred meter uh, K one event come into the Olympics, I was really interested in that the physiology of that, the skill acquisition of that, the delivery of that. And then you know, obviously, I've I've made a strong career within the para side of uh, other sports um and this is a fantastic you know paralympic program so opportunity to lead another strong paralympic program but also an opportunity to work in olympic sport as a performance director for the first time and to realize the potential that this that this program has so yeah i think uh, when when it was offered to me as an opportunity then then i, I kind of grasped it with both hands and i was lucky enough the british canoeing saw the potential in me and offered me the role because you finished at British Swimming on a real high in Tokyo after a brilliant Rio and in an even better London 2019 when, of course, you staged at the World Para Swimming Championships. Was that hard to leave, though, in effect? Um, it, it certainly was. You know, I'd, I'd grown... Actually, if, if I go back to when I started, so I moved from, from, from cycling in 2012 and went into to, uh, being a performance director at, at, at um, Para Swimming in 2013... And that was about developing my own career and moving myself forward and perhaps practicing some of the things that I was preaching to my athletes about moving outside your comfort zone and trying new things and, uh, and putting yourself out there. So, so, so as, I, I, as I took that on, it was a natural step for me to, for me to take. I've always loved Parasport and I will continue to love Parasport. You know, I have a family connection there and it, mean, it means a lot to me. Um, and I absolutely loved the journey that I went on with that with that team. And we, you know, we had some highs, we had some lows, we had some successes and, you know, some, some fairly public uh, ch- challenges. Um, but I massively enjoyed what we what we achieved there. And we, we achieved kind of different things. We went we went after performance in a big way for 2016. And I think we really, really moved that on. And then moving into 2020, we, we really went after holistic athlete development and, and um, you know, treating and seeing athletes as people and performers. And 2019, as you mentioned, there was a huge, huge success for the team, um, not only because we delivered with British Swimming the championships in, in, in a four month period, having taken it over, um, but also because the, the performances of the team there were outstanding and probably singly you know, my highlight of my entire career was leading that team in 2019, the culture we had, the environment that we had, delivering uh, success, both in terms of the event and performance in London, um, you know, seven years after after we'd been there for the Games was, was fantastic. It might strike some people, Chris, as being strange that you can have leading roles in three sports that on the surface are quite different, cycling, swimming, canoeing. So... What are the skills that you can take from one to the other? To put that in a football analogy on anything but footy, when they appoint a manager, they like someone that knows the club. Do you know canoeing when you've been at cycling and swimming? Um, I mean, I mean there, are, there are 100,000 things that are transferable between these sports. If you just go straight to the nature of the sports, when I was at cycling, you're coaching on the velodrome. 
So it was about standing from a stationary position, covering a set distance, whether that be 500 meters or 1,000 meters or 3,000 or 4,000 meters, covering that distance in a race format faster than anybody else could. And if you were the fastest person, you were the winner. You go to swim in, it's a similar scenario. You start on a set of starting blocks, you swim to one end of the pool, you swim back again. It's a set distance, 50, 100, 200, 400 you are looking to deliver that performance in the fastest possible time you can. You could argue it's not even a race because you're not in the same lane as somebody else. You are, your piece of water is your piece of water. And then transfer that over to canoeing. It's the same scenario. Again, we start at the far end of the regatta lake. Um, We cover, you know, a thousand meters, 500 meters or 200 meters. And we're in a lane and we're looking to cover, to cover that distance as fast as we possibly can that there are limited factors that you can change in order to change your speed. You either move, produce the movement faster, so that's stroke rate in, in canoeing and swimming or cadence in cycling, or you move further for each, for each stroke that you do. So, so you might change your gearing in cycling to be able to move further every time you move your feet round. Uh, in this sport, it's about technical efficiency and distance per stroke. So from the point that you apply the, the, the paddle to the water, can you leverage past that point and move further every time that you do that? So there's, there's, there's great similarities physiologically and technologically between those sports that I think I've, I've been able to, to bring and has instantly been able to, to create a connection with coaches about that. Uh, and to be able to talk to them about performance on the terms, you know, each sport uses its own vernacular. It uses its own uh, vocabulary and terminology uh, and jargon in some cases. And you have to kind of get into that and understand that and try and go, well, when you say that, what is it you're actually talking about? Um, so that you can, um, so that you can, uh, you know, work and, and experience that environment. And then, and then if I, if I take it up to just a strategic level, Again, the sports are similar. It is about what is it we are trying to achieve longitudinally, either either in the next cycle or the cycle after that. What's our vision? What's our mission? What are the objectives that will that will give us an indication that we're moving in the right direction? And what are the enabling tactics that that that, that move us in the right direction to achieve the various strategies that we might have? And, and that's no different actually than working with an athlete in a micro level and going. Well, how do we cover this distance in a particular time in order to win the event? So, you know, great similarities that I've been able to draw between between the sports that I think have given me that unique position of being able to drop into a sport and support uh, the ambitions of that sport. Do you think you could be a performance director at any sport then? Um, yes, yes, I do. I do. I think I think ultimately sport is a people business um you know and, and people are driven by purpose uh, and one of the things we work really hard on is understanding why 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 do you do this um and once you understand someone's why and they understand their why then you can then you can support and you can you can motivate when 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 needs be and you can guide um i have applied for roles in in professional sports um and, and come close uh, i think olympic and paralympic sports are maybe uh, slightly more embracing at this point in t- time of that transfer of knowledge uh, between them. When you, when you go into some professional sports, you're faced with, well, you need the technical understanding in order to communicate with coaches. I would push back and say, I don't think you do. Um, I do work in football um, for the Premier League, um, mentoring some of the uh, academy coaches, academy heads of coaching and academy managers as part of their processes um so so yeah I, I do think it's transferable across across lots of different sports and i do think you can bring a brand new perspective and uh, to some sports that don't really like to look externally at what they do you've been in coaching for a long time chris i think more than 20 years how much has it changed you talked about the challenges at british swimming in, in particular how much has it changed from an athlete point of view and also from a coach point of view yeah, I, I think I think significantly, I, I would say um, it, it's changed, and it's about it's about that that balance of, of challenge and support. I think you know the, the analogy that I would use is is that is the British sporting system over a period of time we got incredibly good 
at identifying athletes with the capacity and the ability to get to the top of Everest. And we got incredibly good at getting them to the top of Everest. Maybe where we weren't doing so well um, was supporting them on the way back down on that, of, of that journey. Um, and I always say to staff now, we have to be equally good at getting them up there, you know, getting them back down as we are, as we are at getting them up there. And in addition to that, I would say that, you know, elite sport is, you know, it's Darwinian in its nature. We are looking for the best of the best of the best. You know, there's like, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think it's like 400 people that win Olympic medals out of 7 billion people in the world. So, you know, it's, uh, it is very elitist and not everyone can do that. Um, but it's absolutely right and appropriate that as sports those that don't quite make it or don't quite have the attributes to go to the summit are supported um, in their in their exit from their sport, in their transition, and, and their, their hand is held as they come back down from the mountain and we safely re- return them to base camp. So, so I do think I do think that has changed. And I think Brit, I think British sport has accepted its responsibilities. Um, there's always more that we can do. Um, but you can't get away from the fact that it is Darwinian and we are trying to find the very, the very best of the best. So, you know, the, the challenge that we need to bring and, and the support need that we need to bring is, is it has to be of a, of a high performance level because that is what we are, we are ultimately after. And, and not everyone can be number one in the world. <laughs> by, by its nature so you are going to have people who who don't quite make it who try their hardest and for whatever reason they don't make it and we need to support those people as much as we um as much as we celebrate the medal winning performances because i think uk sport now call it kind of medals and more so it was all about medals but there is so much more to sport than that even at elite level yeah, for, for definite. And I felt myself changing o- over time. When, if you, when I was a, a coach at cycling, you could ask me what it was all about. And it was about winning. It was about winning for me. I wanted, you know, I wanted to, to show I was the best coach in the world and I wanted athletes to perform at the best of their ability and to, uh, and to, to, to win thing. It was number one. Um, since I've become a father, you know, you start to think a bit more broadly and a bit more about the purpose. And, and, and one of the things that really resonates for me at the moment is, you know, I've got I've got two young boys and everything is so instantaneous for them. You know, they, they go, you know, Jake breaks his football. He comes in. Dad, can you buy me a new football? I'll go on Amazon. It's there the next day, isn't it? And I reflect on my own kind of uh, childhood and saving up money week after week after week and going to the shops was an experience and buying things. Um, equally, you know, we used to get a, you probably, you guys will know our price was the old record store, wasn't it? And you'd save up for weeks and weeks and weeks and you'd go and buy the album and you'd have something tangible. You know, my kids go in their bedroom now and they go, uh, they use their, their, their music streaming devices and they, they say Alexa can play Harry Styles and he's there instantaneously. So, for me, sport is a mechanism for teaching them about endeavor, about trying, about perseverance, about pursuing something that is greater and the journey that you go on and the value that that adds and how much you appreciate the reward if you get there in the end because of the journey that you've been on. So um, that my, my, my philosophy, I guess, has changed and it's now more about what, what can we, yes, winning is great and we all love to win, but, but what else can we use that mechanism for? And one of the things I love about British canoeing is I just think the social agenda, the societal change agenda is, is, is strong here. Our environmental agenda, um, our activism around LGBTQ+, you know, all of those elements are, are strong. And we have some athletes that are fantastic advocates for a range of different things that I think are really important. And when you talk about in your career, big challenges and you talk about how you have learned and developed, are you talking about your time with Paris swimming and the bullying scandal, which, you know, you publicly sort of admitted that went on and apologized for? Um, I mean, of course, that was it was a huge learning period period for me um you know i was i was i was new to a leadership role having come from a co- from a coaching role um you know i was in a sport where the culture was was different um and I, one of the things it definitely taught me is that you have to spend time in a new sport understanding what that what that what that culture is uh, and how that and how that sport sport operates 
Um, ultimately, what we were trying to achieve was was, was noble, uh, and and we felt that we had um, strong engagement, strong strong buy in. But what we probably tried to do was just move things a little bit too quickly. And when you when you go in and you make a very strong statement and you look to move things very very quickly, that feels quite abrasive uh, to, to people. Um, and it's also it's not a one size fits all model, you know. And I think. You know, we're, we're seeing that in some of the stuff that's happening in gym, gymnastics at the moment. You'll get different accounts and different experiences from two different athletes from the same coach. Um, and it's it, we have to work really hard with our coaches now to, to help them to understand that what one athlete needs is different to what another athlete needs and that you need to be there for that person and give that and give that person the, the, the support, the support that they need. I think where there's a complexity is you, you might you might have value. So so we might have an athlete who 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 really appreciates that strong level of challenge and wants to be led strongly by by a coach. Now, if you're on the outside and you're perceiving that conversation and the way that that plans out and that doesn't quite align to your values, then you might look at that and go, well, that's not appropriate. That doesn't align to my values. But actually, the athlete is consented. The relationship is there. And it and it's a positive it's a positive environment. Um, so so yeah, I learned I learned a massive amount from that period. Uh, it was a painful time for me. You know, I got into Paralympic sport because my brother was disabled, had spina bifida. I'd been around surrounded by disability my my whole life. Passionate about being altruistic and helping people to develop. And when when people kind of push back and say, no, you created an environment that didn't feel comfortable for me, then that's, that's painful to hear. And, you know, I've, there's, there's not a day that goes by that I don't reflect on that period and, and um, remember the lessons I've learned and, and, and feed that into what I do now. Because it must be such a difficult balancing act as a coach, as you say, you're dealing with different individuals with different needs, different emotions. And whereas someone might need the arm around the shoulder, somebody else might need more encouragement, for example. Yeah, very, very definitely. And it's, um, you know, it's on the coach to learn that and to understand that. Um, but I think one of the things that we try to do now and one of the things we've introduced here at British Canoe is, is more of a team nature to coaching. So, so you asked, you know, how things have changed. I, I think now it's, it's unrealistic to expect that every athlete in your system is going to thrive under, under the direction of one particular coach. So you create a team of coaches and a team of backroom staff and practitioners and performance lifestyle advisors so that the athlete has the ability to go to what they feel that they need to have that support, to have that support in place. And one of the things that we're culturally trying to achieve here at British Canoeing is, is, is helping our athletes to understand that that's, that's how we're coaching in the future. So you might have one person who's assigned to lead um, the support that you get within your particular sector, your particular team squad or crew. Um, but ultimately we're here as a team. So if you feel that there's value in support from someone else or guidance from someone else or a different voice, then, then that, then that, that we can do. And um, we need to give athletes the skills and experiences to be able to take multiple voices, but ultimately have responsibility themselves for their, for their careers. You're listening to Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy. We're talking to British Canoeing's Chris Ferber. And Chris, you said earlier you're really excited about the Olympic side of it. Your your experience, as we've been talking about, comes from a, from a parasport point of view. But the Olympic canoe sprint. But you're going in, losing your uh, former gold medalist, bronze medalist in, in Tokyo, Liam Heath. That's a, That's a tough thing to take over. Yeah, and you know, Liam's been absolutely fantastic, hasn't he? And and, and you know, what a what a tremendous ambassador uh, for the sport. And I, I'm gutted because you know, I I love working with world class athletes. The opportunity to you know, I've worked with some fantastic people in my career: Chris Hoy, Jason Kenny, Dame Sarah Story, Ellie Simmons. Um, you know, the, the list goes on and on. And I was excited about working working with Liam. Uh, and he saw me come in as performance director and immediately announced his retirement, <laughs> which, I'm, which I'm not taking to be personal. So, you know, I think, yeah, he, he was a fantastic ambassador for the sport. We, we very much want to stay in connection with Liam and, and, and he's, you know, very kindly offered his time and his knowledge and uh, we'll, we'll use that to inform 
uh, and support athletes who go on that journey. Um, and we now need to, to bring through the, the next crop of athletes. But we do have some fantastic athletes in our system. You know, I wouldn't have come here if I didn't believe that um, the Canoe Sprint program is you know, it, it is well placed to deliver to deliver in the future. We've got a, a fantastic strategy uh, in place. We're recruiting at the moment for for people to drive that strategy forward. So, uh, yeah, strong strong aspirations for the future. And then the Para Canoe Program, you know, is 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 chock a block full of superstars as well. You know, um, Emma Wiggs and, and and Charlotte Henshaw, who of course was was a para swimmer before she came to Para Canoe. Um, you know, they've got great um, potential to achieve, you know, they've already achieved so much, but they can go on to achieve more in the future as, as well. And we've been dealt a, a good break by by the world governing body. And we now have another event that we can go after in, in Paris, which uh, which is exciting. And you mentioned Paris when they delayed Tokyo by a year. I just thought, oh, well, you know, two Olympics in three years. That sounds all right. But actually, from a sports point of view, and I hadn't really thought about it, I've said this to people before, I hadn't really thought about that means a totally different cycle for you guys. You call it a four year cycle. How different is it for for British canoeing, for Team GB, for Para GB going to Paris on a three year cycle? Um, Yeah, it's, it's a good it's a good question. And I think sport is still trying to understand that a little bit, I think. Um, one of the challenges that we face is, is, is just staff retention and staff energy. You, you know, we went through, as everybody did, you know, a global pandemic where things were, were incredibly challenging and there was so much uncertainty and so much unknown. We then delivered a late games and the, the, the you know, that was like that was like nothing I'd been involved with before. The, the, the level of detail, the level of planning, the level of support required the complexity of it was 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 huge. So you've got tired staff who've delivered something huge that was different to what they've delivered before. And then you've come straight off the back of that and you're into a three-year cycle to deliver Paris. So I think one of the things I think about a lot is just how do we build in downtime? How do we role model that we don't need to run at a 1,000 miles an hour all day, every day? So as a leader, how do I role model um good behaviors in terms of energy management and, and balance and, and and things like that in order to make sure that staff don't feel like they need to completely burn themselves out um and that they arrive in paris in in good shape um i think for senior athletes it, it's 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 maybe not changed things too much other than it, it, it's made that next goal that next objective closer closer so so they have rather than kind of taking downtime off the back of the games and taking a year out you know they have come back and really focused on on right well you know i've now got this opportunity of going to paris and i'm, and I'm going to go after that and that that plays to again that support nature and that balance nature that you you know you've got athletes who are again fully invested in something which you need to be if you're going to be successful at that level but how do we create balance in that? And how do we make sure that when Paris is, is done, we don't end up with a, you know, a, a really fatigued system or, 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 or people that have driven themselves so, so far, either athletes or staff, that they, that they break after Paris. And that's something that, that everyone is, is thinking a lot about. One of the highlights of the Paralympics for me, and I wasn't there because of the travel restrictions, but I was taken to the Para Canoe party virtually. Uh, by Jeanette Chippington. She got me on the phone and she took me in. And it was fantastic to see all your para canoe medalists. Are they all back now as a cohort and, and going again? Yes, yeah, they are. Yeah, we yeah, we we have the majority of them up here in up here in Nottingham training on a daily basis. Um, you know, they they had a sensible process after the games where, well, apart from the fact that they went to the world championships more or less directly off the back of the games, which was challenging in itself. Um, but a number of those athletes have tried new things, have taken a bit of time, uh, a bit of downtime. Um, some of them went away abroad for extended periods of time, and then they're now kind of coming back into it. And as a governing body, we've been really supportive of that so that we can, uh, you can just divert your attention for a period of time and then come back and come back to it. The Para Canoe team here has such a strong culture. Um, you know, they, they, are, they are like a family. Um, and one of the interesting things for me coming in here has been protecting that culture with them 
um, but also encouraging them to look externally at the, the areas where they can improve and develop. They, they have a, a desire and an appetite to stay at number one in the world, which obviously I'm in alignment with. Um, but that sometimes means you have to take the processes that have got you there and just interrogate them a little bit more and see what you can learn from that. And that there are learnings within our own canoe sprint program that will aid and abet that that para canoe program to develop their performances is moving forward and team coaching is helping us to 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 achieve that e equally there's plenty within the para canoe space that, that the canoe sprint program can learn from as well so i'm hopeful that um driving a little bit more integration between those programs can just lift everyone up to the next level so the people maybe listening to this that get you know let's say four weeks annual leave from their job uh, every 12 months they might not understand why an elite athlete needs that extended break so we were speaking to Jane Figueredo Tom Daly's coach recently and and her and Tom took a year off after the Olympic Games people at home listening to this might think a year off and then try and come back into an elite sporting environment how is that possible <laughs> is that a fair comment um I mean, I, th I think it's just the na the nature of, of what we do. You know, the, the focus, the attention, the the I guess consistency. Pressure. Yeah, pressure, consistency. You know, you 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 do not make it to the level that Tom Daly has made it to without consistency of of, of training, of effort, of attention, of fo of focus. Um, and that that can become become really wearing. And, and I have I have this conversation with my wife a lot. She's she's a teacher, and obviously gets um, you know a, a different amount of holiday to, to 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 what to what I get, which is you know challenging in a relationship and challenging when you've got kids. But the reality of where where we're at, you know, and teachers will know that that feeling when a teacher gets to the summer holidays and how on your knees you are and driven into the ground you are and how ready for that six week break you are, you know, that that's how athletes feel and coaches feel when they when they go through the games. Only it's I think it's magnified by the fact that, you know, it, they, they've been at it for four years to get to that point. Um, so, so yes, I think it is appropriate for athletes to take, to, to take some downtime to, to regenerate, to get away. And, you know, we, we had, we had it with Ellie Simmons at Para, at Para Swim. She, you know, she was quite vocal and, and outspoken in terms of not enjoying her Rio experience. Um, and we were supportive of her taking a significant amount of time away from the, from the sport to, to, to really find herself and find the love for it again before she, before she came back in. Uh, and ultimately, then qualified to go to um, to go to, to Tokyo, and she was a real leader within the team for us at the Tokyo Games. So, absolutely delighted that she was there for us. Our time is nearly up. A uh, couple of questions for me: Do you still commentate on mountain bikes? <laughs> oh, no, sadly not. I, 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 I used to love it. You know, I, I I was in my first ever role for British Cycling. I was mountain bike and BMX administrator, and and I was partially responsible for bringing the Fort William World Downhill Cup to, 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 to Scotland. And it's an insane event. They start at the top of Annick Moor, which is next to Ben Nevis. And they race down this course for four and a half, five minutes. And the first person to the finish wins. And you have 15,000 hardcore British mountain bike fans in the arena dressed in kilts and ginger wigs and, and all the stereotypes with air horns and stuff to make noise it's insane i used to absolutely love it and the guy that i used to commentate with dan jarvis he still does it um and i and i miss it like mad but but i, I can't pull off gnarly anymore and wicked and stoked and all this vernacular that you need to use in that environment and you know I'm, I'm too old and finally you mentioned it right at the start does it feel like you've come home because you mentioned nottingham trent does it feel coming back to british canoeing you've actually come home uh, I, I certainly feel really comfortable in this city. You know, I, I had a fantastic experience during university. I really enjoyed my three years here. I'm still very close with, you know, as, as lots of people are still, I'm still very close with the people um, that I went to university with. In fact, in fact, one of them has put me up for an extended period of time while I've, I found my feet. I found my feet here. So I massively enjoy being in Nottingham. I think it's an amazing city. I enjoy being at Home Pierpont, which is our, which is our home. I find it an inspiring place to work. Uh, and that's certainly helped with the, with the, with the transition. Um, you know, but I am ultimately have made the choice to make quite a big sacrifice and my family stayed in, 
in Manchester where they're settled and, and I'm away from the family during the week in order to deliver this role and back back with them on the weekend. So, you know, I think we all make choices within our careers to, to, to do things. And this is a choice that I'm comfortable with and the family is comfortable with at this point in time. Well, we are stoked that you joined us here <laughs> on Great nice. British Bosses. It's been rad to talk to you. Chris Ferber, I never thought I'd say those words out loud. Performance Director for Canoe Sprint and Para Canoeing at British Canoeing. Thank you for speaking to Anything But Footy. Oh, thanks so much. Cheers, guys.